Welcome to my switching routing and wireless essentials course. This should be the CCNA version 7 curriculum. This is the second of three courses. Welcome to lesson 5, STP concepts. This is spanning tree protocol. So in this lecture we're going to be looking at the purpose the operation and the evolution of spanning tree protocol. One of the fun things is this is actually one of the harder technologies. It's overly simple, but when you first learn it, there's a lot of terminology that we got to get through in order to make this understandable. So that makes this topic a little harder than most of the other topics. So what's the purpose of spanning tree protocol? What's the purpose of STP? So basically, when you have three devices connected to one another, you can have what's called a loop, a uh, physical loop of three devices. The issue is, if one device is forwarding broadcasts, it actually creates this broadcast storm, because it will actually start forwarding all these frames out all its interfaces, and all of the receiving devices will get them and forward them out and so forth and so forth and so forth. So it actually consumes all of the resources on the different devices eventually. So the goal of STP is actually to provide redundancy in a layer two network without having a physical loop. STP breaks the loop logically. Here we have that circle, S1, S2, S3. There is a physical loop. And we have connections between S1 and S2, that's trunk 1. Between S1 and S3 is trunk 3. And between S2 and S3 is trunk 2. Well, this is a looped environment. So there has to be a way to actually prevent one of these trunks from actually turning on. And that's the goal of STP. It will logically disable an interface to prevent this loop from occurring. If there is a failure, for example, between S1 and S2, then the switches will actually turn back on the link it had previously turned off to provide that alternate path. That's called that STP recalculation. That way, it's not a looped environment anymore, and it can disable the link between S2 and S1. So again, having multiple paths is a good thing. However, when there is a loop, that loop can provide instability in the form of wasting resources of the devices. Things like um, forwarding out those frames may cause link satur uh, saturation, may cause the CPU and RAM utilization to go sky high, and other resources just to be consumed. In a layer three environment, we have a TTL, a time to live. So each device would actually decrement at one. However, with layer two, there is no mechanism to eliminate our endless loops, so we have to do it at the switch level. So without STP enabled, layer two loops could form. When the loops do form, it would cause instability in the network. A unknown unicast frame could actually accidentally cause a broadcast storm. And again, a broadcast storm is just an abnormal high number of broadcasts that overwhelm a network to the point that all resources are consumed. So, a host that is caught in a layer 2 loop will eventually become unaccessible because, again, the devices have limited resources and all of those resources are being used to uh, process these broadcasts it essentially becomes a denial of service attack. STP has what's called a algorithm. That's what calculates the paths. 
It's called the Spanning Tree Algorithm, STA. The STA creates a loop-free topology by electing a single root bridge. A root bridge is basically like the master switch that will allow us to figure out what ports to turn on and what ports to turn off. This master switch, this root bridge, allows us to prevent loops by turning ports into different states depending on how they're operating. So how did STA create a loop-free topology? It creates a root bridge. Basically, this is the reference point that the rest of the network is built off of. It actually will start blocking redundant paths so that there's only one logical path to flow, thus creating a loop-free environment. When the switches detect a failed link, there is a recalculation to verify that paths are still accessible. If a path is not accessible, they may turn on a blocked redundant path, freeing up a logical connection, thus allowing one connection to flow through the network, not creating loops. We do have a packet tracer investigating STP. Again, these are done in other videos. So let's go ahead and talk about operation. When a switch is turned on, STA will start happening. It will elect a root bridge. It will elect root ports. It will elect designated ports. And it will elect a alternate blocking port. During the STA and STP functions, the switches will send BPDUs to share information. Each BPDU will contain a bridge ID. Basically, this is a clever way of identifying what switch is sending data. The bid is involved in making many of the STA decisions, including figuring out which is the root bridge and root ports. The bid will contain information such as priority value, the MAC address of the switch, and if there is an extended system ID or VLANs associated with a particular switch. The lower bid, normally some form of combination of these three fields, will be the root bridge. We're looking for the lower of the information. There is actually a very specific process to electing. It will look at bridge priority. The default value is 32768, and you can modify that. Again, the lower the bridge priority, the more preferred it is. A bridge priority of zero will take precedence over all other bridge IDs. Next will be this extended system ID. Basically, the extended system ID is a value in a decimal form added to the bridge priority value in the bid to identify the VLAN that's associated with the BPDU. So if everything has equal bridge priorities, then it'll look at the extended system ID. If they're all the same, it will look for the lowest MAC address. Whoever has the lowest number will become the root bridge. So the STA will designate a single switch as the root bridge, and it will use that as a reference point. In this example, even though the MAC addresses are going to be the lowest on switch 2, it will look at priority first. Priority, extended IDs, then MAC addresses. Here we have a modified priority of 24577. This specifically is the lowest priority, so that means S1 becomes the root bridge because it has the lowest uh, BID. It will then designate ports accordingly. If everything is left default, 
then it will look at extended IDs, and then it will look at MAC addresses. Now we need to look at what the trunks, the links between switches costs, because this will help us determine what the different ports are going to be. So the different costs are going to be based off of the link. If it's a gigabit link, it's going to be a cost of four. If it's a hundred megabit link, it's going to be a cost of 19. This basically just allows us to figure out which paths to take. Example, if we are trying to go from PC1 to PC4, we can see the path costs. We can go switch 2 to switch 1, or we can go switch 2 to switch 3, switch 3 to switch 1. And from there, we can figure out the appropriate costs. Switch 2 to switch 1 is a cost of 19, meaning that's a 100 megabit connection. If we're going to take the other alternate path, switch 2 to switch 3, switch 3 to switch 1, that's going to give us a cost of uh, 38. Because again, there's two links of 100 megabits. So that kind of lets us know which path we should keep up. We should keep the shortest path, which will be the link between switch 2 and switch 1. And we should disable the link between switch 2 and switch 3. The ports going towards the root bridge will be called a root port. So here we have FA01 on switch 2 and on switch 3. As they are going towards the root bridge, that's why they're called root ports. Ports that actually are flowing away from the root bridge will be called designated ports. So on switch one, F0201 and 03, as they're leaving the root bridge, they're all designated ports. The uh, switch three, as it has information leaving it, going away from the root bridge, it will actually classify the link between S3 and S2 as one of them being a designated port. Here it elected F2 on switch 2 to be a designated port. That means the port F02 on switch 3 will actually be called our alternating port. That will be the port that is logically turned off. This will be our backup port. This essentially will disable that link until the root bridge has determined the link between S1 and S2 have been compromised. If link one goes down, it will tell switch three to turn on FA02, thus restoring connectivity. So electing a root port from multiple equal cost paths. Again, we always look at that lowest bid. We always look for the lowest priority. And if we're talking which port should be the appropriate port, it will be the lowest sending port ID. So if we have equal ports, whatever is going to be the lowest port number, that will be the uh, root port. For example, here we have where this is going to be the lowest sending bid. We have elected S1 as our root bridge. Ports going away from the root bridge are designated ports. Ports that are going towards the switch, the root bridge, will be our root ports. So switch 3 F1, switch 4, F3, those are our root ports. On S2, whichever is the lowest port, that will let us know which one will become our root port. 
and the other port connected will become our alternate or our blocking port. F1 is lower than F2, so F1 becomes our root port. So what happens if we have a lowest sending port priority? What happens when we have two switches connected? Which one will be the sending priority? Here we have one that actually has a bridge ID priority that was modified. So here we have 24577. This lets us know that switch one will actually have our root bridge that will transition on switch one, F01 and F02 to designating ports. Again, the lowest sending port priority will actually be the one that stays connected. Sorry, since we have two ports on switch four, the lowest one is actually going to be change to our alternate port. Because both ports are connected to the same switch, the sender's bid is equal. So the first step is a tie. So the next will be the uh, port priority. The port priority is 128. So both ports on the switch one have the same port priority. So it's also a tie. However, if either of the ports on switch one were configured with a lower priority, S4 would be put in the adjacent port in a forwarding state. So, F01 is the lower of the two. So that means the adjacent port, F06, should be receiving our root ports. And our F05 will become our alternate port. If we're looking at the lowest sending port ID, the last tiebreaker, if everything else is equal, the lowest sender port ID, basically from switch four, it will connect to switch one's F01 and switch one's F02. The decision is based on the sender's port ID, not the receiver's port ID. So again, the root bridge is the sender. Since it was sent on F01, that is the lower of the two. That means the receiver will put that as a root port. So let's talk about convergence time. We turn a switch on, we have STP enabled. What happens? Well, the switch actually has to go through the selection process. So STP actually has the convergence requirements. It actually has to elect its root bridge and that takes time. So there are three timers that come into play. We have a hello timer, a forward delay timer, and a max age timer. All of these can be modified. The hello timer basically is the hello time is the interval between the PB, uh, BPDUs and by default it's two seconds. But you can modify it between one and ten. The forward delay timer is basically the forward delay is the time that is spent listening and learning the default is 15 seconds. And you can modify that between four and 30 seconds. Lastly is the max age timer. And this is the uh, maximum length of time that a switch waits before attempting to change the STP topology. The default is 20 seconds. But it can be modified between six and 40 seconds. Basically the switch can, when it comes on, it has to listen, it has to learn, it has to decide what states to be uh, putting the different ports in. So what ends up happening is when the switch power is on, it goes into an immediate blocking state. No PPDUs will be received and this will happen for about 20 seconds. It will transition to a listening state. Basically the forward delay is 15 seconds. If a uh, link does come up, the link actually is in a blocking state and then it will transition to a listening state. From the listening state, it will transition to a learning state, which will forward uh, the information. 
accordingly for about 15 seconds. Then it will actually start transitioning to a forward state. The important part here is how information is modified. In a blocking state, it can only receive BPDUs, no MAC addresses, and there are no forwarding of data frames. As it transitions to a listening state, it will send and receive BPDUs, but it will not update its MAC address table, nor will it forward data frames. From the listening state, it will transition to a learning state. Here we're still sending and receiving BPDUs, and now for the first time, we start actually updating our MAC address table. We will not forward data just yet, we're just updating content. From our learning state, we will transition to a forwarding state. The forwarding state will send and receive. It will also update the MAC address table, but this is actually going to be when it starts forwarding data. So when you turn on a switch, it can take almost 60 seconds for the switch to start forwarding data. And this is the reason why. We can have STP on a per VLAN basis. We can have it as a per entire environment or per VLAN, it just kind of depends. If we're doing this per VLAN, it will be called PVST. This is just a variation of STP. So now let's talk about the evolution of STP because there are multiple versions. The one of the more complex versions of uh, spanning tree is MSTP, way outside the scope of this exam. But we also have what's called rapid spanning tree protocol, RSTP. The latest IEEE documentation on STP basically says STP has now been superseded by the rapid spanning tree protocol. So the IEEE uses STP to refer to the original implementation of spanning tree and RSTP. So the nice thing is STP is all the variations of STP. The nice thing is we have a hybrid called per VLAN spanning tree plus. That is the default variation of spanning tree protocol used on Cisco equipment. And this actually incorporates many of the specifications of the original IEEE 802.1D, including things like alternating ports and a place to form a non-designated port, things of that nature. So it actually allows us to deal with the rapid spanning tree protocol without having to enable it because per VLAN STP plus actually incorporates some of those technologies. A variation cheat of all the different types of STP. PVST plus is the default. MST or MSTP are way outside the scope of the CCNA exam. Rapid spanning tree is a newer version of STP and is referred to as 802.1W. So let's go ahead and look at RSTP, also known as 802.1W. This actually superseded the original STP, 802.1D, but it retains backwards compatibility and it has some of the additional uh, advantages, such as increasing the speed of recalculation of a downed link. RSTP can achieve much faster convergence when it's properly configured, and we're talking milliseconds instead of seconds. So way faster. So we actually have what's called rapid PVST. This is the uh, Cisco implementation of S uh, RSTP on a per VLAN basis. Basically it's R PVST plus, and it's an independent instance of RSTP. And the important part here is for RSTP, it has to be ran on a per VLAN basis. All of this is not really capable of being ran in Packet Tracer. STP does not work very well in Packet Tracer. So STP versus RSTP, when we're talking about the different states of the ports, when we actually have operational status 
We have our disable, our blocking, our listening. Well, in RSTP, all of those are discarding. Only learning and forwarding line up. When we're talking uh, ports, we do the exact same types of ports. STP and RSTP both have root ports, designated ports, and variations of blocking ports. We can have a backup or alternate port with RSTP. And again, RSTP can also be done per VLAN. So we can actually have an alternate port and a backup port that provides us some failover options. So now let's talk about port fast and BPDU guard. What happens when you know the device connected to a switch port is not another switch, so it should not have to worry about listening for BPDUs? Well, that's what port fast does. Basically, it says this is going to be an access port and only in devices will connect to it. So do not do the operational states of STP. It will also never receive a BPDU because, well, only in devices should connect to it. Alternates to STP are things like RSTP and MSTP. Layer 3 routing allows for redundant paths and loops and uh, topologies without blocking ports. But when we're talking layer 2, layer 2, there's only so many options. That is STP in a nutshell. We talked about different forms of STP, how STP and how STA function, the purposes of a BPDU, the different types of ports, the different types of STP, RSTP, PVST, RPVST, MST, MSTP, and so forth. We ended up with talking about port fasts and BPDU guards. We also talked about um, BPDU guards. We talked about layer 3 routing and redundant paths and things of that nature that may actually circumvent our layer 2 issues. So, that is this lecture in a nutshell. If you have any questions, concerns, whatever, please reach out so we can get those answered. Thank you.